Hi, Eric. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on Meaning of Life TV. Um, oh, I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Uh, let me introduce you uh, and myself. Um, I'm Philip Menchaca. This is MeaningofLife.tv, as I'm sure people have gathered. And you are Eric Vance, a science writer whose work has appeared in uh, numerous places, the New York Times, Nature, National Geographic, uh, I think Harper's, mm -hmm. um, among many others. Uh, and you're also the book, the author of this book. We have Suggestible You, which is going to be the subject of our discussion today. And as the subtitle says, it's about the curious science of your brain's ability to deceive, transform, and heal. Uh, so put simplistically, it's about the placebo effect. Yeah, I mean, placebo effect ends up taking up a big piece of the story. Um, you know, I think it's the first third is placebos and sort of all the stuff that comes out of placebos. But I also do have a section on uh, uh, hypnosis and another one on false memories and the similarly related nocebo effect. Uh, and so that gets into curses and superstitions. So there's a lot of different stuff that sort of falls under a broad headline of, uh, of suggestibility. Yeah, it's a, it's a really fascinating book. You take us through a kind of fun journey about both the history and the science behind uh, how the brain can uh, change the body based on belief. Um, and so we'll get into, uh, you know, cover those topics. And I think uh, particularly one interesting aspect of this is potential genetic factors underlying some of mm -hmm. the um, placebo effects. Uh, there's a researcher sure. named Catherine Hall, but I'm jumping ahead. I just want to start out just asking you how you got interested in this subject to begin with. Well, <clears throat> I mean, on reflection, you know, I can't avoid mention the fact that I was raised in Christian science. Um, and uh, so I, I didn't go to a doctor until I was 18 years old. Uh, I, I sort of... Um, I, I was sort of raised on the placebo effect, if I, you know, if I can say that. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and, you know, I didn't really necessarily, I mean, it, it, when I write about the book, it sounds very clean. Like, you know, I was raised in Christian science and I went on this journey to understand it. It didn't feel like that at the time. I, I sort of wandered around a little, a little bit. And I, I always did wonder though, you know, Christian scientists and, and for that matter, people who go to homeopath or, or acupuncture or anything else that doesn't really, outperform placebo like these people aren't aren't crazy they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're going and, and just to give people uh, a idea about what christian science is in case they they don't know that's well at least this one aspect right. of it um they christian scientists believe in healing through faith uh is that correct yes yes yeah so it's and it's actually there's some interesting elements of it that, that made it especially interesting from a psychological point of view but um but yeah we were faith healers um and we believe that uh that god's law heals people and not and not material medicine say we uh, I'm no longer in the in the religion um, but I was always curious about the things I'd seen you know like, you know people believe in, in in Christian science or these other things be, not because they're crazy but because they work because you know these people you know I, I saw people get healed mm -hmm. when I was younger and I, I always wanted to know more about what that was you know what what that could have been and um, and so it sort of percolated uh, you know, in the back of my mind for a while, I got out of the religion and I became a scientist and I became a science writer. And uh, I was at a conference for brain mapping when I bumped into, well, I didn't bump into, I saw the keynote speaker was, um, was someone who I recognized as another Christian scientist. And they were giving a, a, a talk on placebos and like a light went off in my head. And, and it's like, I always say it's like, like um, it's like a recovering Catholic studying the neural underpinnings of guilt, you know, like it, it just fits really, really well. And, and so like, like this researcher, I sort of got hooked on, on these ideas. Yeah. And I think what's interesting and also important to note here is it's not just uh, chance um, that these things like faith healing or other sort of remedies sometimes do result in, um, are, are sometimes effective. There's something else happening. It's not yeah. just, um, you know, a statistical aberration or, or the, the, the expected statistical aberration. Um, right. There's something well, going on. 
Um, when, and people who study placebo effects, they, you know, I say the placebo effect because it's what people understand, but they're actually placebo effects. Mm-hmm. And there's multiple effects. And, and some of those effects are statistical regression to the mean, kind of like, you know, people get better because they took the pill at their worst and you always get better after your worst. Um, like those things exist and they are placebo effects. Same with um, sort of trying to please a doctor, you know, and tell them you're feeling better when you're really not. Those That's also a kind of a placebo effect. But those weren't the ones I was interested in. Those aren't the ones I think that are the most important for science. The ones I'm interested in uh, deal with actual physiological changes in your body related to expectation. Like that's when it gets interesting. Yeah, and I think a good place to start perhaps is with um, homeopathic remedies. And, and you have this one sentence in your book. You say plenty of things that don't exist are useful, such as homeopathic uh, remedies and Santa Claus. Right. <laughs> um, and so you explain kind of what you mean by that. Sure, sure. Uh, I think uh, I, I think it says. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it was in relation to uh, to this uh, this great report. If 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 your viewers are interested in, in this topic, there's this report written by among other people Benjamin Franklin, and uh, and he was kind of debunking uh, and and uh, Anton Mesmer, Franz Mesmer, shoot, um, Franz Mesmer, who uh, who uh, um, uh, uh, basically was the king of, of some of these placebo ideas that I talked about. He, you know, he had all of Paris going nuts for all of his, uh, of his, uh, his, uh, like magnetized water. And Franklin said, um, if something doesn't exist, it can't be useful. You know, he's trying to first prove that it, that it exists, this magnetizing to see if it's useful. And, and I should, well, I mean, a lot of things that don't exist that are useful. I mean, Santa Claus is really useful and then, you know, he doesn't exist, but homeopathy falls in that list. Um, because, a study after study shows that, that homeopathy does not outperform a placebo. You, you can't say if something is a placebo if it's not a placebo. What you can say is does it outperform a placebo? And if it doesn't, if the placebo is here and the homeopathy is here or here, well, then it has to be a placebo. You right. know, that there's, you know, even if there's something active happening down here, if it doesn't get above a placebo, you know, you're 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 you're, you're stuck with having to. Uh, um, having to call it a placebo, and and what's what then becomes interesting is okay, so then how does it work? Especially when some of those placebo rates can be like seventy percent. Seventy percent of people who take the placebo pill feel better, and that's huge. I mean, that's a <laughs> large number of people. <laughs> so with homeopathy, I mean, it's it's not always that high. You know, it's pretty pretty clear that it's not really performing. But you know, if you have a real drug and you have a seventy percent. Uh, response rate placebo, you'll never know if that drug works or not because you can't, like, not many drugs can outperform 70%. I mean, it's insane. I, I've seen small studies of like nearly 100%, which basically negates the reason for doing a study. If, if everyone's going to get better on the placebo, why do a study? Yeah. Uh, so this becomes a huge problem and, and a really fascinating um, opportunity to look at how the brain affects the body. And that's where I got really interested in this. And so, um, and what I learned was that it's not equal across conditions. Like, and that's, and that's something you learn if, if you go into a homeopath, good homeopath, you know, they, they'll say, you know, or, or acupuncturist, I had an acupuncturist and he said that the, the best things that this, this treats are, are, you know, pain, depression, anxiety, stomach problems. And he lists off these things. Well, he's, he was listing off all of the things that respond well to placebos. So there are these this suite of conditions that we can have uh, and throw in there Parkinson's disease, autoimmune disorders, and um, uh, some forms of uh, asthma and uh, a couple others. Addictions kind of hanging on the end there too. Um, but then if you look at uh, if you look at something like uh, um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease or um, obsessive compulsive disorder. These things don't respond well to placebos. They have a very low response. So this, the rules that govern pain don't apply to these other conditions. And, and that's why this is also interesting because there are rules at work. And it turns out many of these rules are actually biochemistry. There's actual chemicals that your body is releasing during the placebo effect that affect pain mm-hmm. that affect anxiety but they don't affect alzheimer's so so, so there are like two di- kinds of categories of illnesses we're talking about here ones that uh are well i'm not exactly sure if you can say if it's fair to say that they're more physical but something like like cancer or as you said alzheimer's where you're not going to see placebos have uh much impact but then you have things like depression and pain where 
you get a much higher success rate with placebos, um, with something like homeopathic therapies. And those are, uh, those remedies, we should say, there aren't really any active ingredients in mm -hmm. any sense of the word. It's mostly, just, it's, it's, you've taken a, a substance and watered it down, literally diluted it until it's basically water. Um, right. And in, in one case, in the book, I actually, uh, one of the things they were prescribing was melted snow. Right. Which is water. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't even food. It was, it was former snow. And the important thing was the quality that, it, I mean, you know, the, the, the story that was being told, the quality that that, that that snow held to that patient, which is very important. And it was releasing chemicals inside her body. But that was her expectation that was doing that. Right. And um, this is what you point to is this is maybe this is one of the key parts of your argument in the book is that it's the storytelling around these placebos that is so important and that uh, causes these actual physical changes. Well, you're and I, I often say, I mean, belief is I mean, there's there's many different kinds of belief. It's one of those weird psychological words that just people just, you know, toss into everything. But, you know, in, in my experience, there's sort of three types of belief. Um, there's the belief in, in God, something that you believe very deeply but can't really prove. There's the belief in, that the Cubs are going to win the World Series, which is something you might have a lot of evidence for, but you're not really sure about, you know, if it's something you really want to happen. And then there's the belief where it's like, you know, if I drop a pen, it will hit the ground. Like gravity works. And that's a belief that's very, very deep. It's there's evidence for it, and, and it's just you don't even question it. It's, it's that strong. And so what I basically look at in the book is what happens when one of those earlier beliefs becomes that last kind of belief, where it becomes so real, so true that it has to happen. Well, what happens is your brain steps in and makes it happen. Because you, when your brain has a belief like that, a really strong belief, it doesn't want it to be wrong. It doesn't want to recalibrate everything. So it'll fudge, and it will do that with these chemicals. It'll sort of drop in these chemicals and fudge, for instance, pain. And I, I had, at one point in the book, I, I get electrocuted to the point where my leg is twitching. Really, really hurt a lot. And then through some trickery, um, I end up getting that shock, but thinking it was going to be something else, really believing it was going to be something else, and the pain disappeared, almost disappeared. I still felt a little twinge, uh, which I expected. Um, and basically that was my brain medicating itself so that expectation meets reality. Like that's all it wants. And that's kind of at the heart of what all this is, is making sure that what it expects happens. So, so the electric shock you were receiving didn't actually change, correct? You were, no. You, you thought it did. They changed them for a while. They changed the, the – earlier on, they, they go high, low, high, low, and then they, they associate it – this is in a laboratory. They, they put a color with it, green and red, green and red, and, and they, they kept those colors going, but in the last run, they gave me the high one every single time. But when I saw those colors, I had been trained to think that the low, lower paint should be coming. So my brain stepped in and made that happen, which is the same thing you do when you take a, when you take a pill – your brain expects pain relief. It's been taught that this pill means pain relief. And so if it doesn't happen, say it's a placebo pill, your brain will just step in and do it for, for you. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll take over that job on its own. And have there been studies that have shown that, that have been able to measure specific changes in chemicals like, like serotonin and dopamine? Yes. So it's... So that's, that's the thing is, is, and you said there's two categories. There's actually kind of three. There's the, there's the, there's the ones that we really know probably are not placebo prone. There's the ones that we know are, and there's a bunch in the middle that we're like, uh, you know, like <laughs> autism. I included autism in the book and, and it, there's actually, autism gets, gets tricky because, um, there are placebo effects that happen from the parents. You know, it's like, it's a placebo by proxy. You know, your, your parents think you're getting better and, and, and you do this all kinds of confusing middle stuff. So, Pain is the easiest because you can do it in a laboratory. Like I can, I can cause pain and take it away in a laboratory, right? Yeah. So we understand like opioids are involved. Internal, you know, endogenous opioids are involved in that one. A little bit of dopamine probably too. Um, when you start talking about anxiety, when you start talking about depression, you can't – anxiety – you can kind of create a laboratory depression. You really can't. I mean, unless, you know, maybe, maybe you can hold a picture of a, of a political candidate, someone, you know, just one for candidate. Someone in depression. particular comes to mind right now, but <laughs> yeah, whoever, but like, you can't, you can't like induce depression in a laboratory. So it's like, um, so as a result, we don't really know as much, but yes, yeah, serotonin is certainly, I mean, you know, the genetics of it have been, have been looked at in terms of placebo. I think it's fair to say serotonin, um, and uh, uh, um, 
uh, opioids, dopamine, um, endocannabinoids is another one that's like a like a, a, a marijuana like chemical that exists in our brain, um, and uh, a few others. The, the, the list is getting longer, mm-hmm. but when you look at some of these conditions that are harder to study, there may be other specialized chemicals that that are that apply to. Um, I mean, for instance, stomach pain, irritable bowel syndrome, we know is very responsive to your suggestion. But the exact chemicals involved, well, dopamine's involved in stomach processing. So is something called ghrelin, which seems to react to your ex- ex- expectations. But we, we don't have a list. Like, we don't know all the things that are involved. It's, it's hard to study. So I often talk in terms of pain. And when, when you see studies, they'll be mostly about pain. But one can assume that there are drugs for each one of these other chemicals, something going on. And in fact, um, there may even be different pathways for uh, conscious pain relief versus unconscious pain relief. Like it, it may be real complicated. Wow. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, and we can talk about that. Yeah. This is a great experiment where uh, they gave people placebos and they said, these are placebos. And they took them and said, okay, what are those? And the patient said, oh, those are placebos. And they still got better. Some of them did. And knowing they were placebos, that's because a lot of this is unconscious. Mm-hmm. And they, they, you can't Just the help. act of taking the pill and because we associate that or perhaps because we associate that with getting better just a simple act even though they knew it was not or anything. or even one step further we've been trained mm-hmm. for for that to mean you're getting better like you know all those times you took pills all your life i mean maybe not for me growing up in christian science <laughs> I never took pills but i mean you know the average person there's a certain amount of training that yeah. happens so there's the conscious you know bit is the storytelling like you were telling you know, you know this pill will do and when you ever watch it the easiest way to see this is when you watch a commercial for uh, a drug you know right. everything turns red and then you take the pill and it gets blue uh, you know like whatever this is this is storytelling like that's not actually how the drug works yeah. but that you're telling a story that resonates and 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 that's the important thing to remember is placebo effects aren't about only about homeopathy and, and inert pills they're also about drugs that 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 actually work on top of the, the chemical reaction which that commercial is all about right it's trying to get you to really expect a lot and so that's the conscious side. But of course, the unconscious side has been all the other times you took pills and you got trained, your body got trained to have a response. And, and there's some really interesting science that's sort of trying to pull those two apart, but it's not easy. But that's, some, that's the next generation. Of yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, this gets, gets to an interesting question. I think this brings us a good point here, uh, which is why some people respond more strongly to placebos than others. And you point to this really interesting research by, um, well, one of the researchers is, is Catherine Hall, um, and about the genetic uh, mm-hmm. factors related to why placebos affect some people more than others. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first I should say that, and this was actually one of the early things that got me into this book, was there's this, there's this, like, this sort of uh, almost mythical sort of creature that is the that is the placebo responder that scientists have been looking for for like 50 <laughs> 60 years you know and this person who just you give them anything and they'll just respond and and on a very basic level i feel like i know these people like and scientists felt like they have to be out there because we all feel like we know these people who are just like oh they take something and they just feel better you know or they take a crystal put it over their body whatever they feel better it and and the problem is it, it it hasn't been as simple as we wanted it to be like you know and they've tried to line it up with race age uh, ethnicity, sex, uh, personality type, um, hypnotizability, all kinds of things. It just hasn't lined up with anything. This, this, um, And what's worse is that it doesn't stay stable in your life. You can respond one day to one thing, another day not. You can take a group of people and you can give them all placebos and you know the people who get better, you can remove them from the study and then do the study again and give them placebos. And new placebo responders yes. will grow up out of the ones who were left. And it's like, you can almost imagine these scientists like shaking their fists. So it's, you know, Catherine, this, the scientist you mentioned, she took an interesting take on this. She said, okay, well, what if it was a genetic thing? And it's not about finding a person who is a responder. It's about if we remove a certain genetic trait from, the, from a group of people who are taking placebos, will the placebo response go down? And, uh, and she found, um, a really, really good, uh, candidate for like the placebo response. And this is not the placebo gene. It's it's probably going to be last time I checked, there's like 30 different genes that are now that have been added to this list. And they're the scientists who's working on this, there'd probably be over a hundred, but, but this one 
is a big player, and it was big enough that you can you can see it. And when and when and it, what's great about it is it's a single rung on the on the DNA strand. So usually genes are you know multiple rungs. You know they're large complex pieces of DNA. This is one rung. It's like you know if you imagine it's big twisting DNA strand, like it's just one, and that actually uh, determines uh, uh, how. How a protein that 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 um, think of it as like it, as like a Pac-Man that eats dopamine uh-huh. that basically regulates dopamine in your brain. How that protein functions, like it, it, and that little little piece on the on the on the DNA ladder basically controls uh, the important working piece of that of that enzyme that regulates uh, that regulates dopamine. So like if that piece isn't right, you're going to have a huge difference in in that. That enzyme's ability to gobble up um, dopamine, which means you have a whole lot of extra dopamine. And dopamine's a really, really important chemical. So it's like this, and it's been studied a lot. It's like the really great thing about this is called COMP. It's been studied up one side and down the other. Um, also with behavioral stuff, which I get into the book, you know, because you can, you can, you feel like you can kind of spot someone who's a, who's a certain genotype as opposed right. to someone so else. So you break it, it's, it's, there's like three, uh, I believe it's three different uh, yeah. variations of this. One where the where compt um, this this protein is very efficient and mm-hmm. so it doesn't leave much dopamine hanging around in the brain. Right. Um, one where it's it's mixed. It's not super efficient. It's not super lazy, um, right. and that's what most people have. Correct. Half the half the population has that one. Half yeah, the population. I do. I have it. <laughs> and then uh, and then there's the the lazy the lazy bum protein right. um, variation. Yeah, he just says, he gives, and actually, the, the half and half is actually they have half the bums and half the, the hardworking ones. But when you when you get the other the other extremes, the you know the really uh, lazy ones versus the really hardworking proteins, um, you see this. Well, first of all, you see some personality differences, like uh, the way that people rate things, which is very interesting. Like, interesting. Uh, oh, this, this, this that that movie was amazing. I love that movie. It was so good. And then it was like, ah, it, the lighting was a little weird, and you know, like this. And this is isn't necessarily for everybody but if you take a thousand people you know you will see this this trend for how for how people respond to like something that's happened to them um and then also those people who rate things really high though they also have more placebo responses so um it's it's and those are the people that tend to have more dopamine or that, that their protein yes. is not working as got a hard lazy as enzyme they got a bunch of dopamine laying around a bunch of extra dopamine and of course Dopamine is going to find a place to be useful. You know, it's going to it's going to make you feel good. Like, and there's all kinds of things that, that happen with this. And uh, I, I, you know, um, I, I do this for two reasons. One is like I really want to be able to like spot placebo responders. Be like, oh, Barack Obama, no, Tom Cruise, yes. You know, like <laughs> go through <laughs> the world and know this. Of course, it doesn't work that way. And so what what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to show. Uh, sort of the basics of how this might work and how we might create a screen to start screening out someone's placebo response. And at some point, it'd be good enough that we could tell, you know, day to day or, you know, one condition versus another. Maybe someone is a pain placebo responder, but not a depression placebo responder. Yeah. Um, and, this, and these, go ahead. Yeah, this gets to the, the really exciting part about this research, this line of research, is that it could lead to a whole new sort of medicine. Um, or if right. you can start identifying people that are placebo responders say, and, and specifically what kinds of placebos that they, they might respond to most strongly. Well, you and, and we've been talking about homeopathy. We've been talking about uh, inert pills, which is which is great and everything. But we forget that placebos are actually the cornerstone of medicine, modern medicine, as you know it. Like and 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 that's because any drug that makes it to the market in the United States has to be has to outperform a placebo. It has to do better. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, when when and this is not a very old law. It's like what is it? It was uh, the 1960s, early 60s. So th- you know, in, in terms of the history of medicine, this hasn't been along very, around very long. But when they actually enacted this law, the Kefauver was uh, Estes Kefauver was this this um, the lawmaker who made it, sort of made it happen. Um, uh, they had to go back and check all the drugs that they've been using for years and years, and they got rid of a thousand drugs. This is a thousand drugs that couldn't outperform placebo that they were using, that they were regular part of everyday medicine. So, so we've been sort of using belief and basically superstition, you know, up until the '60s. So, and since then, you have to be able to outperform the placebo. Now, 
as we mentioned, this is getting harder and harder. I mean, if you have some of these placebo responses, depression is insane. You've got these really high placebo responses that drugs are, you know, Prozac only barely passed. Um, and, and new iterations are having a hard time overcoming a placebo effect. And there's some thinking that maybe the placebo effect is going up in the population, which would blow my mind. Um, <laughs> but if you have this problem, now if you could get rid of, of all the placebo responders, right? Now, if you could figure out who these people were, or not even get rid of the responders, just like get rid of this genetic group of people who, when they're gone, there's less placebo response. Let's not label those people. And you mean um, you mean this within the studies of within the, the study? Yeah. Take a study, and you first of all, um, so uh, you would still have placebo response because we all have placebo response, but it would be a lot lower. So suddenly, drugs become much cheaper to make. Um, also, you would be able to know earlier if a drug is actually working, because a lot of this is like, try it out. If it's not working, or it doesn't beat the placebo, you know, tweak something. You, you have a lot more, you'd be able to see things a lot easier. But then you would also have, you know, if this became part of the phase three trial, which is the last trial to beat the placebo, if you get rid of the responders, you would have, um, you would have a, a lower placebo rate, so a, more drugs would theoretically be able to come to market. But what's interesting is they wouldn't they wouldn't be allowed to be taken by the placebo responders. They'd only be uh, certified for the people who had the genetic uh, the, the genetic types who had been in that study. So the people who would be most likely to benefit from those drugs, i.e. the placebo responders, wouldn't be allowed to take them uh, because they weren't in the study. And um, it opens up, I mean, you sort of start seeing how this might work. And uh, and it's also a little disturbing in a lot of ways. Like the placebo response is really the backstop for pharmaceutical industry and then, and they're eating away at it. So I've gotten a lot of uh, a lot of response online from people who feel very threatened by this. Honestly, I don't know what to think of it. It's it's a very hard thing to wrap your brain around. Yeah. And uh, you, you said that did you have a recent article in the Washington Post was it about about this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it actually was just in the the Sunday uh, the Sunday edition um, and it ran online a little earlier than that and uh, I talked to a bunch of um, pharmaceutical uh, representatives and, and actually there's a there's a new organization that's funded by a numerous large pharmaceutical companies that have finally realized you know we all have these shared you know, they're fiercely competitive but they have these shared problems among you know and, and among these companies and so they've created this and one of them is, is the placebo response I mean that's this huge shared problem they've all got is how do you beat the placebo response and so they created this organization or a, a joint uh, organization that, that's, that's starting to address some of these questions and look at how you can change, you know, uh, study setup and 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 one of the things they're looking at is the genetic question as well. Mm -hmm. You know, taking Catherine's work and 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 wondering, well, I mean, what would happen if you could get placebo rates way way down? Now it may be that nothing would happen because. The drug, like as the placebo rate went down, so the drug. But don't forget, the drug is also using placebos. Like they're not right. alone. So it might be they just went down together, and you still have the same problem where you can't get over the thing. Uh, but um, but I think evidence at this point probably suggests that wouldn't happen. I think they're not equal. Yeah, there, there's a lot more going on. So I I mean I guess you can see how this is good for the pharmaceutical companies because it lowers costs. It means they can get their yep. drugs to market. Is it, uh, does it have any benefits for the consumer? Yeah, obviously, I mean, it, uh, it, it, one of the big things is, um, is what's called a phase two trial, which is sort of proof of concept. And uh, one, some of the people I talked to in this, in this, in this story, in fact, the guy who's, he, there's a company that's trying to create the screen that screens out placebo responders. And he came, he was one of the people who made the decisions about which drugs would sort of continue on to the next step and you know and this is you know this is, this is a billion dollar decision you're trying to make it's like this drug or that drug who are we really going to invest in and all he wanted to do was take both or you know a couple extra every year because every year you got to make your choices and uh, a lot of these drugs end up on the dust heap and i also talked to some uh pharmaceutical uh um, executives whose job whose company is based around taking these discarded drugs and trying to see if they can make them work. You know, what, what was missed? And, the, and a lot of these, especially these ones that are, that are not chosen, they, they deal with a lot of uh, 
uh, conditions that, that cause a lot of suffering. You know, I mean, a chronic pain is a, is a huge, huge problem, but psoriasis and uh, schizophrenia, I mean, schizophrenia is one of those ones where it's really hard to tell, like the placebo rate, and, and, and I sort of didn't include it because it's, it's in this sphere, but we still haven't really figured out how it works now. If you could, and there's not really any drugs that work, work real well for schizophrenia itself. It's yeah. more for the, so, so, I mean, if you could address, if you could, you know, double or triple the number of drugs that were, that companies would even pursue, you know, by getting them past that proof of concept, you know, schizophrenia might be something that, 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 that gets uh, a treatment, you know, whereas, whereas it hadn't before. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a huge benefit for our customers. Um, because and the, all the, the pharmaceutical companies will then have the resources available to start pursuing a lot of treatments that right now they can't. Right. I mean, you know, and a lot of it, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe they would, you know, in lieu of the big blockbuster drug, maybe they try something a little, uh, a little more, you know, targeted, you know, I mean, you know, oftentimes, you know, they, they may just go for the big blockbuster because if you're going to spend a billion dollars on something, you know, it better make you some money, you know, maybe, maybe some of these other conditions, uh, get a second look. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's really where I think the, um, where the, 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 you know, where, where we would benefit, you know, and especially some of these folks, and a lot of this applies to folks who aren't getting relief from existing medications, but even, you know, even something like morphine, like it doesn't affect everybody. Like none of these drugs that we rely on every day affect everybody. And so, you know, you have to try all these different things and, and anyone who's been the doctor knows there's a long process of trying different, different drugs and seeing which ones work, which ones don't. I mean, the, the, I think the real benefit would be, uh, helping people who aren't getting helped by drugs already, you know, finding that new thing. And that's where, that's where it gets exciting, but there's, it's not without its serious ethical questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, if, if placebos have these true physical effects, if these kinds of treatments are changing the amount of dopamine in your brain and changing the amount of serotonin in your brain and having, um, observable physical effects, it does raise a question, you know, where is, what is the difference between a placebo and true medicine? Where does that line lie? It's a really good question. Um, and, and especially when you talk about, um, gosh, let me think here, uh, any, any kind of alternative medicine that, um, where, you know, there may be an effect, like a lot of traditional Chinese medicine, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, like ginseng, I'm pretty sure doesn't, you know, relies pretty much on the placebo effect only, but, you know, but then you look at something like art of medicine, which, you know, is a really important, um, malaria, uh, treatment now, like that did, and that won a Nobel prize for that, that research. Um, like that, that's a piece of Chinese medicine that, that was doing something. Now there's a lot of stuff in between where, um, where it may be doing something, but it's just not doing as much as the placebo effect is, right? So you can't see that. Like if if it's, if it's the placebo effect is more effective, then then whatever the the, the 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 herb is that you're playing with, you know, you won't be able to know that it's actually treating thirty percent if the placebo effect is forty percent. And so that's um, that's where that question really gets interesting. And the other place is placebo effects have for a long time been considered temporary. And and that you know it's one of the characteristics of a placebo effect is that it's a temporary uh, it's a temporary effect, um, and the question has arisen lately whether or not there are placebo effects that are permanent, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you are you can reprogram the brain, sort of retwiddle the knobs that that control how much endogenous opioids you know your your brain is using and producing, yeah. and if that happens, and I, and I do I talk about some interesting cases along those lines, well that's healing. That's that's a cure, you know. That that that's that that is medicine, you know. That's that's what it's doing. And and at that point, uh, you're talking about, you know, real relief to people. And and if you talk to pain doctors, this is you know they get it. This is something because they have a hard time treating chronic pain. Yeah. And this is something that it is medicine. You, it's just you, coming from your head. You point to this one case that's particularly striking. Uh, this patient who had Parkinson's, and. Yeah went through this trial surgery, his trial treatment, which turned out not to 
uh, be effective or not to. Um, it didn't out, didn't beat the placebo effect. Right. Yeah. It didn't beat the placebo <laughs> effect. Yeah. Um, and he learns this, and 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 during the testing period, he had this huge improvement in his life. Was able to, um, you know, it really changed his life. Um, I think I think I think he ran a partial marathon and went hella skiing. Yeah. Uh, this is a guy who was having trouble walking, and and now he's getting out of a helicopter and skiing down a mountain. Yeah. You know, I mean, life changing is putting it mildly. Yeah, and. Um, and then he finds out it's a placebo, or, or it didn't outperform the placebo, right. and yet so he found, the benefits continue. And that's where we get to, to, to your point that maybe there is a possibility that some of these have lasting effects where they kind of retrain the brain in some sense. In his case, it was actually a surgery. It was a, it yeah. was a, it was injecting this, this drug deep into his brain. And, um, but because Parkinson's is so placebo responsive, in fact, it's, it's, um, it's really can be really really difficult to treat because of the high placebo uh, uh, rate. They um, they have to compare it against a sham surgery, which is basically where they just drill a, a little divot into your into your skull, but then they don't do anything else. Like it's just it makes it feel like something happened to your skull. And uh, and because of the people who responded to the placebo response in this trial, because they it was so high, um, this this treatment uh, that was being tested failed. And that company actually went out of business. But, I mean, they got purchased and disappeared. And it was crushing for the doctor who, who was this, this patient's doctor until she realized she unblinded it. And they realized and that this patient had been one of those placebo responders. Like he, he was skiing down a mountain after getting a placebo surgery. Like it's insane. And this was like a two year long. This is the thing that they made this, this study really long, probably one of the longest recorded placebo responses ever from from this particular study because it was like two years and and really you know mark i mean parkinson's doesn't get better you can slow the progress you know medically but you can't you can't actually make it you can't make it go, go down and yet this seemed to happen and so uh and so you do have this question of um you know it's not permanent because it, you know Parkinson's is, it, you know, it's a, it's a degenerative disease, but it, it you know, in case of, of chronic pain and other things, you, you can get these similar things that happen that are permanent. And this certainly, in his case, like, it, it life changing, mm -hmm. like no drug could ever hope to have that kind of a, of a success rate yeah. in Parkinson's, <laughs> you know? So then what, what is, like you said, what is medicine? You're self-medicating is what, is what, the, the what the best explanation would be is that you are tapping into your brain's ancient um, internal pharmacy, you know, the pharmacy inside your own head, and that yeah. we've had for a very long time. It's, it's slightly switching veins here. One of the fun things about your book is that you didn't just go and talk to scientists about this. You actually tried out some of these, uh, as you alluded to earlier. But was there one particular experience that was uh, particularly striking for you? Um, gosh, they were all, you know, anytime, you know, everything, what's interesting is that we all do this and we all have our different ways that we tap into these, we talk about the theater of medicine, these ex field expectations and, and, uh, you know, it, you know, what, maybe it's a laboratory, maybe it's a doctor's office, maybe it's, maybe it's the local, you know, shaman or, you know, sort of the crystals around it. Every, we all have a thing that resonates with us that, that, that tells us, okay, we're going to get better now. You know, and what was interesting to me, so every time I, I'd step into these these different situations, I, I was I was always learning things. I just continue to learn things. Like it's just fascinating to see how people interact, intrinsically knowing that you know when, when you're a caregiver and someone comes in your office, like you intrinsically start tapping into whatever whatever you think will help this person get better. And and it was very striking when I went to a, a witch doctor's office in, in Catamaco, Mexico, which is a very famous witch doctor town. It's, 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 it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of history and a lot of pride in their, in their witch doctor, brujos, they're called witch doctors in the greatest translation. But, um, and I went there sort of expecting what I'd heard, which is, uh, like people who would like, giant fire pentagrams and people would like spit over you and blow fire and like dance around. There'd be like feathers and Aztec warriors, like all the crazy stuff. Right. And, um, or say, Oh Mac, they're, they're actually further, further east. Further back. But, uh, but yeah, so some of your, some of your viewers will catch that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, 
what I was shocked to learn was, um, well, first of all, I, I went and I talked to some of these, these people that are having a festival and like they were all kind of for tourists and most of them were kind of like, just, you know, scam artists. I was just like, this, this, I was so disappointed. You know, all the, you know, dancing craziness was, wasn't there. So I went and I talked to some locals and they said, well, we don't go to those witch doctors. Like our group calls are up the street. And I was like, great, let's talk to them. And when I went and I met with one of those brujos, his office looked like a, like a doctor's office. Uh, he had like a nice waiting room and he had the stuff up on the wall, not, not plaques, like, you know, but he had like, you know, various things on the wall. It sort of felt like maybe, you know, uh, you know, not doctorates, but, you know, sort of like, you know, his bona fides up, up on the wall, pictures of religious pictures. It was just had a very, and even the smell was the same. All the subconscious triggers are all, he, he wore a white coat. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, it was, and what I, what I realized is that um, the brujos in this town have adapted to changing expectations. Uh, the modern person in this town doesn't, you know, they, they don't, they don't, go in for brujeria by itself like now they go to a doctor it's the you know modern medicine has come to this town for yeah. you know, well over a generation and the, and the brujos have have adapted to that and so there's a new way to create confidence in locals and and you know like that um uh the local shamans have adapted and 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 tapped into the, those expectations uh and you know and he instead of having like you know like magical vats of different things he you know have a little Plastic spray bottles. It was very antiseptic, and that's how that's that's how you tap in now to expectation of that community. And it's the same way that you tap into expectation in in our in my community. You know, you you uh, you, know, you walk into a doctor's office and they start using big words and they pull out some weird tool and you just think you're getting better. They they know what they're doing. They got it. They got this weird thing. Who knows what that's for? I'm gonna feel better. And that's what all this is about. It, yeah. It's about storytelling and it's about this theater. Yeah. Um, and none of us are immune to it. <laughs> so one, uh, one final question, I guess. Uh, so one criticism that some people might have is that when people start talking about alternative medicines like homeopathy and acupuncture and, uh, you know, some people say, well, this is just fostering distrust in modern medicine or it's discouraging people from seeking treatment from rep reputable physicians. And mm -hmm. how would you respond to that? Or do you have... Uh, yeah, no, I, I hear that a lot. It's, it's also underlying a lot of the conversations I've seen on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, I, it's a, and it's a great point. You know, I mean, what's interesting is, is a lot of placebos do, a lot, do rely on deception. And in the yeah. laboratory, they also rely on deception. And this is a big question that scientists have. Um, there's, there's a couple points that, um, that I sort of come to understand. And the first one is, uh, People have always done this, and they're always going to do it. And like, you, you, you can't, it's not like, oh, what if you know, what if people went to you know to homeopaths and random shamans to get better? Like, people will, people do. There's no no study. You pick a continent, pick a pick a city. Like, we all do it. A lot, a lot of people do it. Um, but the other thing I realized is when when you sit down, I mean, homeopath homeopathy is a great example of this. You know, like a homeopath spends a lot of time with their patients. And they they really get into their um, their you know their perception of the disease, you know, really what what's driving it, and um, it's because they don't have any active chemicals to use. What they've got is that that interaction, and as a doctor. If you don't take advantage of placebo effects, if you if you can't figure out a way to spend more time with the patient, to create more of a rapport, you know, and and, and I have a story about a scientist who like had to figure out how to do this. She was doing studying placebos, and she had to figure out how to make people have placebo responses, and she had to be more confident and change her behavior. With other people it might be being more empathetic and you know, listening more. But if a doctor doesn't do that, you will lose people to these alternative forms of medicine. You will. Mm -hmm. And because people will go and find that. And so um, I have very little patience. I mean, I, I have zero patience for the, for the alternative medicine doctor who says, don't go to the regular doctor. I will heal everything you've got. Like that's dangerous. But I have less, I have, I have very little patience with a doctor who complains about patients going to a homeopath when he's only got 10 minutes to give that patient. And he doesn't even look up from his clipboard. You know, like you are not tapping in to healing. You're, you know, you're, you're treating a set of symptoms. So that's, 
it's something for doctors to learn from. And it's something, you know, it's a system wide thing. That, I'm not the first one to make this observation. This is something, it's a real problem we've got. Yeah. Uh, but the last thing I, I came to as well is, as I mentioned, there's certain things that respond well to placebos, which means they respond well to alternative healing by and large. I mean, and, and unless some of these techniques can be proved out uh, um, scientifically, you know, we're talking about placebo responses. And um, when you talk about chronic pain, it's a great time to start thinking about tapping into belief. Uh, when you're talking about Parkinson's, it's also, you know, a pretty good time. And you can talk about combining them with, with medicine. But when you talk about something like cancer, that does not respond well to belief. And so, um, you know, it's important to have some some self-reflection and say, is this thing I'm taking maybe a placebo? And if so, am I risking my life by just taking this, by just going to the, uh, to the vitamin infusions or just going to the, you know, the herbal medicine and not going to the doctor? Because a lot of, a lot of people die every year because they, they either didn't want to go to the doctor. And believe me, I was raised in Christian science. I know about uh, the fear of doctors. Like I, you know, we grew up with a fear of doctors. But um, if you know, if you've got a critical disease, the heart heart disease, another one. I mean, also related to belief. But you got to go. You know, for those lethal conditions, you got to go. You got to go to uh, conventional medicine. And then you can talk about mixing. And a lot of doctors, you know, are understanding of that. But um, you do risk your life. There are. There are opportunities to really do damage to yourself yeah. uh, if you don't appreciate the limits of placebo. Yeah, well, this has been, this has been fantastic. Um, there's a lot still we can cover. Um, <laughs> hypnosis, we didn't get to hypnosis. Uh, uh, once, once you start, the chapter on hypnosis, you guys got you got to read that. It's one of the most crapped on uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 phenomena in, in the history of medicine. It's like this amazing thing that people have just crapped on for decades. But uh, there's a lot of fascinating stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, your books. Have you have you tried using hypnosis to boost book sales? I think you should. Have. I, yeah. <laughs> hypnosis. Oh my god, that's boy. No, I haven't. Note to self. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of group hypnosis is actually based on peer pressure, and so, like, you know, peer, you know, working on the peer pressure angle right now as best I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I will assist you there. Uh, everyone listening should should go out and uh, check out Eric's book, Suggestible You. It's it's very fun, very it's, it's fascinating. Um, and like I said, there's a lot more in there that we didn't get a chance to cover in our conversation. Um, right. So thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Yeah. All right. All right.